Welcome, welcome, welcome. Now, some of you, I recognize some of your faces, some of them I don't recognize. Um, you may know that for years, we used to have a meeting generally every month, and maybe the summertime they took a break. Um, and we decided around the time when Engage Estero became Engage Estero and moved on uh, from the ECCL, that we had to break it up a bit. And that's one of the reasons you see we have these public forums, which are really focused on a specific issue. So we're doing that. We've had three of them. The last one was the, was the development uh, forum. And I'll talk a little bit about it later on. But I just wanted to reiterate, we will be having these monthly meetings, but they're not really monthly meetings. We're just going to call them community membership meetings. And you'll get plenty of notice uh, about when they're going to come and take place and who's going to be speaking and so on. Tonight, we have two great speakers. Is he here? Are they all both here? Cody's here. Chris. Okay. <laughs> Forget what I said. Okay. All right. We, we have two great speakers. Um, uh, Chris Whitman is not here yet, and he may have a problem coming here. Who never, never knows? However, we do have with us Cody Pierce. Uh, Cody Pierce is the Calusa waterkeeper, newly anointed. Uh, he replaced, if you can replace John, right? We know that. Uh, yeah, I can't, you can't say replace. No. Yeah, <laughs> right. Uh, Cody, Cody's passion really is to protect and restore the Calucci, Calucci River from Lake Okeechobee to the coastal waters. His experiences include an early background in reptiles, wetland, rest, wetland restoration, and native plant landscaping, and a career as a professional fishing guide. So he knows water. Um, he, he's in the field experience, or his in the field experience, uh, across local uplands, wetlands, estuaries, and near shore Gulf waters serves him well as the Calusa water keeper. So with that, you please welcome Cody, and he'll come up and talk to you. Come on up. Okay. That's fine. Remember, that's up. Okay. That's no, no promises. We'll go back and forth. But we'll yeah. yeah, yeah okay. Good. Yeah. Well, it's good to see you guys tonight. Thank you for having me. My name is Captain Cody Pierce, and I am a lifelong local of Lee County. I currently reside on the north end of Pine Island. And as Jim was expressing, I have just come out of a career as a professional fishing guide for the last seven and a half years. So I had the opportunity following Hurricane Ian to follow in John Kasami's footsteps to take over as the Calusa waterkeeper. It's an honor that I'm very proud to have. And, and uh, I'm about seven months into my career now, but um, it's the greatest honor I've had thus far in my career. So this is the agenda, and we're going to go over a couple of different things, but we are going to stay focused on Estero Bay. So I may go kind of quick with some of the information tonight, but any questions that you may have, I'll follow up at the end of the presentation, okay? So a few of the things that we're going to go over is about Calusa Waterkeeper, who we are and what we do, some of the issues that we're dealing with in our watershed, such as Lake Okeechobee, um, as well as some of the homegrown problems that come from a development standpoint, as well as some of the um, weather conditions that we're experiencing now just coming out of the hottest year on record, um, as well as some of our solutions and our action items. Let's see if I got this correct. Wonderful. Okay. So Calusa Waterkeeper, we are a Fort Myers-based nonprofit organization that's dedicated to the protection of the Caloosahatchee River and estuary from Lake Okeechobee to near shore waters. We as Calusa Waterkeeper began in 1995 as the Caloosahatchee River Citizens Association. And then in 2016, we obtained uh, full member status with the Waterkeeper Alliance taking on the name Calusa Waterkeeper. So this photo here goes over a couple of the different chapters inside of Florida. So we have 15 different chapters inside of the state of Florida. And just to our south, we have Collier Waterkeeper. So we'll talk about some of the goals of our watershed. One thing that I'd like to point out, if you take a notice of that blue outline there, we have one of the largest territories in the state of Florida. My territory goes from the northern end of the county, which is Boca Grande, all the way to the south and ends at Bonita Beach Road, and then proceeds easterly to encompass the entire Lake Okeechobee drainage region, which is 
Fish Eating Creek, and Nicodemus Slough. So a couple of our goals for our watershed is to improve water quality, restore ecosystems, and protect human health. To promote public education about water quality in Southwest Florida, such as we're doing tonight. To monitor water, to monitor water quality with help from our volunteer rangers and inform the public of the results. And to advocate for water quality to our institutions and leaders. So we'll start to discuss some of the issues inside of our watershed. So a little bit of background here. Um, historically, Lake Okeechobee flowed south in a slow sheet flow that supported the Everglades. The Caloosahatchee River was excavated in the late 1800s. This was at a time that the shipping matter in Florida was mostly done by sea, and they found a direct route from Fort Myers, which at the time was the largest produce exporter in the southern United States. Having this direct line straight to the Atlantic Ocean cut off some eight or ten hours of their trip as well as a lot of fatalities that were beginning to happen as a result of the ships colliding with the reef systems of the Florida Keys. Following a devastating hurricane, a dike was built to raise the south edge of the lake in the 1940s, which completely cut off the water flow to the Everglades. The reason that we mention this is that at that time, that was kind of the line that was drawn in the sand that really set forth some of the water implications that we're experiencing today. Once we completely alter the hydrological flow of South Florida at that time is when this process started on getting the discharges going in a westerly manner as well as an easterly manner. So we'll talk about a couple of the consequences of the destruction of our estuaries, which is really just that change in hydrological flow coming from the lake at that time. You know, in an estuary, they're always changing seasonally with daily tides. However, each species has a tolerance zone Using the Caloosahatchee to drain water from the lake hurts our local ecosystems in two ways. Too much or too little fresh water kills oysters, seagrass, and larvae, as well as some other aquatic species. But one of the biggest things that we deal with that you see on the news all the time has to do with the movement of nutrient-rich water that carries and accelerates algae blooms into the canals and estuaries. So when we impacted that watershed, we took away a process that's known as sheet flow that we mentioned earlier. The duration of time that the water would stay on the surface of the ground and go through different types of marshes greatly um, changed the amount of nutrients that can be carried in the water because now the whole process, now that we've taken over this, the land and we needed it for agriculture purposes, is to get the water off the land as quickly as possible. What that does is the water contains lots of different types of nutrients, and then it's shipped east to west as fast as possible, and then we see a higher amount of nutrients that reaches the coastal waters, and it started this really strange process of dealing with huge red tide blooms, sometimes the blue-green algae that we experience in the river, and this has started the decline of the estuary. So one of the things that comes to um, fruition every summer for the past five years, unfortunately, um, is dealing with blue-green algae blooms. So historically, those wetlands that we just talked about filtered and cleaned the water flowing across the land. Without that natural filtration, the algae are next in line to benefit from the nutrients. Blue-green algae lives in fresh and brackish water canals, rivers, and estuaries, and it has the potential to create toxins that harm wildlife and humans. So algae being a single cellular organism, have the opportunity to utilize that nitrogen that comes out of our inland waters in a much quicker fashion than any other complex ecosystem or flora or fauna at that time. So things like seagrass meadows that create a lot of or support a lot of biodiversity in our ecosystem are starting to be replaced by these single cellular organisms, algae. There are many different types of algae, and we'll go over a couple of those different types here in, in the presentation. So another consequence to this nutrient-rich water that makes its way from inland to our coast in a much quicker fashion is the heightened amount of red tide, also known as Carina brevaris. So red tide is a saltwater algae species. It is a natural occurring um, organism in the water. It is just exasperated when it comes into contact with high amounts of nutrients. There are records dating back, you know, quite a few hundred years, especially when the, the conquistadors and some of the Spanish missionaries came over they obtained um, or they experienced some of these red tide blooms along the west coast of Florida and they wrote about them in our diaries. 
We have known that this has happened for quite some time, but what we're seeing is an increased prevalence of the red tide when it happens because the nutrients is on a scale that we have never experienced before. Some of the issues with red tide is that it creates dangerous toxins that are harmful to humans, fish, and wildlife. And now we're gonna go through a few sets of slides. So inside of Estero Bay, and as well as our watersheds to the north that make up Matt Lachey Pass and Pine Island Sound, as well as Charlotte Harbor Aquatic Preserve, we've seen this shift in balance of the amount of nutrients that are left inside of the system, and then this manifestation of the single cellular organisms, which are algae. One of the most predominant algae that we are experiencing here is known as dapis algae. Dapis algae, as you can see, has a lot of surface area, so it's able to photosynthesize quite quickly and then it metabolizes the nitrogen that's found inside the watershed. What's pretty interesting is that a lot of these um, algae matters are starting to process the nitrogens that come out of the inland waters. So there's two different types of nitrogen that can be encountered. There's an organic and an inorganic. The organic nitrogen would come from living organisms or seagrasses that are decaying that can come in the form of ammonia. And then the inorganic source is the one that has um, chemical properties that are manifested by land, i.e. fertilizers. Another thing that's contributing to some of the water quality issues here are man, in, man's impact, especially after the storm. In this image behind me here, we can see um, quite a bit of, of turbid water that's coming out of um, some of the beach renourishment work that's currently being, or that was currently, I'm sorry, that was being conducted at the time after the storm. What was interesting about this is that this introduced quite a bit of silicon into the water. So silicon is a natural occurring mineral that comes out of the sand since we have a high quartz content of the sand that makes up this area topographically. And we saw this increase of silicon inside, inside of some of our coastal waters as a result of the sediment being um, dredged from inland pits put in trucks, trucked to the coastline inside of a sluice box and pumped to the beach for a quicker manner of getting the beach nourishment going. All that sand had never had a chance to be able to be percolated or filtered by natural processes since we're removing it from deep in the ground. Um, so that made the situation pretty unique. That's something that, that we're not sure yet. This is the first time that we're seeing these high levels, so we're starting to document that. Thank you. So this image here is one that, that usually gets people's attention. This is another stage of the dapis algae that's currently going on in some of the areas of, of our county. Um, this white that you see on the image here is a pigment that's leaching when it's deteriorating as it's starting to perspire. This algae being having a lot of surface area is able to photosynthesize quite quickly. But when we experience super high temperatures and higher UV index than before, we also see the counter side of this, that the algae manifests quickly, but then it also perspires rapidly as well because of the temperature. Here's another photo of the same dapis algae within a couple of weeks' time. So this is the end result, and then here it is at the very beginning. A lot of this algae showed up as far as nutrients that came after hurricane and storm surge took out Mount Lache Causeway. This photo is, is in one of our coastal bays here, and it is another example of a lot of the dapis algae. We call this a rack line. And what's unique about this is that you have such an accumulation of this organic material. It really gives us a good idea of how long the algae can last, the different growth periods, as well as the different deterioration rates that are currently happening with that, as well as trying to take water samples from this because the amount of bacteria um, that's in this area that, that is eating the algae um, is extremely high. Here's a photo of a affluent um, compound that is um, experiencing a high level of cyanobacteria growth on the surface. Um, this is something that we saw as a lot of the nutrients were deposited after the storm surge. So now we'll talk about some of the issues that we're currently experiencing. And one of those is that development is outpacing conservation. So Estero Bay is separate from the Caloosahatchee, but we'll talk about some of the reasons why it's in trouble. Um, some of the issues at hand are stormwater runoff, impervious surfaces, lawn chemicals, golf courses, reclaimed water, retention lakes that don't work, septic tanks, aging neighborhood and municipal, 
municipal waste treatment and infrastructure, as well as some agriculture runoff. It's a classic tragedy of the commons. Everyone contributes a little bit and no one is responsible for the cleanup. So this is a, a example um, that, I, that usually gets everyone's attention. So everything that's highlighted in red here was the development in the year 1960. And this is the development as of 2020. So this gives a really good example as some of the changes that we've experienced here in the last um, you know, 60 years. We have, this population has grown to the point that we are now almost a metropolis rather than a rural South Florida. Um, this also increases the amount of chances for these types of nutrients and runoff to impact our waterways because it happens we are, happens on such a higher level of, of small amounts of pollution. Correct. Yes, so this is the Caloosahatchee region, and here is the Stero Bay. Yep. So we go back, we still see a little bit of development down here on Fort Myers Beach, as well as down by Weeks Fish Camp, and there were a few places um, near Moloch Creek at that time. Now we take a look at it, and we can see. <laughs> So some of the water quality decline issues are the fecal indicator bacteria that make people sick or at unsafe levels in many of the waterways we all use and enjoy. On our yearly analysis of our sample sites, sometimes we see in excess of 60% of our testing sites have failed the water quality standards for fecal indicator bacteria. Another issue that we experience is that seagrass is down to 4% of its historical range inside of Estero Bay. What that really means, and one of the main concerns is that that seagrass is being replaced by the algae, because again, that single cellular organism can take advantage of the nutrients at hand, and then it can rapidly expand much quicker than some of the native uh, flora species. Another issue is the nitrogen that we talked about, both organic and inorganic, has increased by 250% inside of the watershed. This illustration is one that shows a couple of the different types of native seagrasses that we experience inside of Estero Bay. This turtle grass species here, Thalassia, is one of the most common species. This is the primary one that's left inside of Estero Bay. If you've ever visited Lover's Key boat ramp, that main, sand, main sandbar that makes up kind of the skeleton of the intercoastal waterway there is the largest of the seagrass flats that's currently left. A couple of other species to mention to you is gonna be manatee grass, shoal grass, widgeon, and then paddle grass. The star grass, we don't see too much in Estero Bay anymore, but these main guys here were what made up the rest of the seagrass flats that were found around Mount Key. So this photo here illustrates, it came from the Charlotte Harbor um, watershed summit that took place earlier this year. South Florida Water Management District is responsible for taking seagrass studies, which happens on a two-year basis. So we're currently waiting for the updated information from this past year, but I have another highlight of this that we'll talk about here. So if we look on the left-hand side, this was the 2013 seagrass um, study that had um, been conducted. I'd like to really point out a lot of these key areas here that showed a lot of the thalassia um, growth. And then on the right-hand side, this is the 2021 data. So we have had a decline in the amount of areas that seagrass was found inside of Estero Bay, and that's one that, that is of concern to us. This, this photo here illustrates another growth form of, of the algae species, Dapis. Um, the thing that I like to highlight here that we talk about is inside of our water testing procedures, this is a sulfur stain. The sulfur stain is made up from the gas that's released from the bacteria that's decomposing. The reason that this is of interest to us as far as studying is that when this bacteria breaks down, the cells rupture, and that's when it can release or has the potential to release uh, cyanotoxins in the air. Later in this presentation, we'll talk about our ATOM project, which is where we actually sample aerosolized air and look for these different types of toxins. So now we'll talk about some of our solutions. So one of our biggest things that we do at Calusa Waterkeeper on a monthly basis is that we do fecal indi indicator bacteria, water sampling, and then provide this information to the public. So what we do is that the Department of Health has a number of testing sites, which are most primarily swimming areas inside of the county. We kind of fill the gap between 
their testing sites and then other areas that we know that the community is actively engaged in waterborne um, activities such as fishing, skiing, boating, swimming, snorkeling, anything in between. So we do the FIB sampling every month as well as our um, sampling for harmful algae bacteria or blooms. And then this information is posted on a monthly basis to our website as well as news organizations. So I'd like to just take a moment and talk about some of the water quality ratings on here. Anything that's within the zero to 35 NPN range is gonna be what DOH considers to be safe standards. And then anything that goes higher than that, so the yellow, the red, and the purple are what gets to be extremes. And I'll go back a slide here. So this data here came out of September's data sampling. And if you can notice the colors, we have much more yellows and reds and purples than we do the green. This is something that takes place fairly often. You can almost call it a trend. A lot of these areas that we're testing, as you can see here, we have a number of sites throughout the Starrow Bay trying to um, accumulate data on these areas that we have a high amount of population. That's the closest amount of proximity to a Starrow Bay. We'll go forward a couple slides. So this is a data set here from the last uh, 10 months of, of sampling for us from Astero Bay, and these NPN numbers are what um, we just discussed about earlier. Just like to point out a couple of them that we routinely see numbers in the triple digit range. So part of the way that we're able to obtain these water quality results, we use a process um, that utilizes quanta trays. They are what we use to read the results after the water sample has been taken, it's been processed, the reagent has been added, and then after a 24-hour period of incubation at 41 degrees Celsius, we're able to count the numbers of cells that are UV reactant, and this is how we obtain that actual count. So it's a little hard to see on here. Oops. A little bit hard to see on here with the contrast, but a number of these cells react just like a black light. So they're UV reactant. And then whenever one cell doesn't contain the bacteria, it almost comes up as clear. So this is some of the equipment that we utilize for our testing procedure. The three um, devices you see on the left-hand side here are incubators. These are regulated and tested all the time to make sure that they're kept at a, at a constant 41 degrees Celsius. And then this apparatus on the right-hand side is the UV sterilizer. So I'd like to talk about one other factor, one that really had a big impact on the, on the reason that we had Hurricane Ian, and that is that we're in the second year of El Nino cycle. Tonight is the perfect opportunity to talk about that with some of this abnormal rainfall that we're experiencing. So an El Nino cycle usually has abnormal weather, high amounts of rainfall, and especially at sporadic periods. We also have longer dry spells. We just came out of a drought that was over 13 inches in deficit. This is also an increase in, in different wind velocity. So if you've noticed this past year, we've experienced a lot of east and southeasterly winds, more so than we have in the last couple of years. Normally on this coast, we experience high amounts of a westerly wind, which is what creates and keeps our beaches so clean. These large rainfall events also purge, um, leading to a high amount of stormwater runoff as anything that's been accumulated on higher ground is then dispersed um, into the watershed. So another thing that I'll briefly mention is something called a TMDL. There are TMDLs and BMAPs. A TMDL is a total maximum daily load that's allotted for a specific water body. A TMDL is important to get listed first, and the secondary, more protective side of things is known as a BMAP. A BMAP is a Basin Management Action Plan. This is how um, DEP regulates how much nutrients is allowed to be introduced into the watershed, what the ecosystem can be um, okay with, that it can still maintain in a proper fashion, have a, a good, healthy environment. Um, and I'd like to just point out a couple of things that affect this region here. Anything that's highlighted in right has a high probability of a nitrogen input into our watershed. So that goes back to our organic and inorganic nitrogen sources that can come from fertilizers, it can come from decaying plant material as well as um, grass clippings, anything of that nature. So a couple of things um, we wanted to talk about again is that um, 
the verified list of impaired waterways for the Estera Bay watershed. It was adopted in 2008. Um, what we see is that this watershed has been updated a couple of times. We've seen some of the impairment um, parameters have been changed. Early on, there was a mercury problem that has since been removed off of their impairment list, but we still see this nitrogen input um, being at too high of a level. So some of our other impact programs are air monitoring. In 2021, we designed what we call our ATOM unit. This is a unit that we use to sample air over a 24-hour period, which is simulating a person who lives by the water with algae. And we also partnered with the brain chemistry labs to analyze these samples. We are on the leading edge of science, working to fill the gap in monitoring for algae toxins in the air. We are one of two waterkeeper groups inside of the United States that's currently conducting this type of testing. Since we've already had the ATOM unit up and running, we've been able to partner with the University of Miami conducting um, what they call the DISPEL program, which is where the university is starting to look at some of the cyanotoxins that are inside of um, different environments and the impacts on humans. We have been able to detect toxins in both water and air samples, and we are testing to find a standard for safe levels, expo safe levels of exposure. Currently now, there is not a standard on how much is too much, and that's something that we're, we're hoping to be able to contribute to the science by providing our data um, to some of these other organizations as we're, we're finding our way. A growing body of research suggests that these airborne algae toxins may affect human health with chronic <laughs> exposures linked to neurodegenerative diseases such as ALS. This photo here illustrates some of our Calusa Waterkeeper Rangers that are inside of the lab at SCCF. We use a testing procedure called ELISA. The ELISA testing procedure is able to identify um, cyanotoxins such as microcystin down to um, a very, very um, precise number as far as a recording goes. So this testing procedure takes quite a bit of time, but it's one that we're happy that we've been able to work with SCCF on and get the process underway. Mm -hmm. SCCF, which is Sanibel Captiva Conservation oh, okay. Foundation. So they have one of the largest labs in our neck of the woods, and um, they've been very gracious to, to help us with some of the different testing. So this photo here is, is one of our action items. Um, we currently do different events where we construct what we call our bogs. A bog is a vertical oyster garden, which is a string of used oyster shells that we string to put into different types of water bodies, especially canals. These oysters can, um, they allow growth to happen much quicker than just having um, a couple of small oyster systems that are on the bottom of the seafloor. Being able to have these on a vertical axis helps with the water quality, with the amount of tide that runs in and out. And what we've seen is that we can get 100% inoculation sometimes within 45 to 60 days. Now, this bog that we see here had been in the water for about 28 days. And the first thing that starts to show up is a lot of the mussels that you see up here. And what we've started to learn is that we go through a couple of different species before we start to get large accumulations of oyster. But all of these different types of bivalves contribute to water quality. This is a photo here illustrating one of our um, events where we constructed the vertical oyster gardens. This is something that if you're interested in participating, we do have this on our website, newsletters. Um, anything that you construct that day, you're able to take those home and, and put them inside of your watershed. Another thing that I'd like to talk about, so Estero Bay has some of the highest amounts of oyster reefs in the entire county, which make it pretty unique. It's also one reason that we should take more consideration on trying to um, expand the amount of oyster opportunities for them to expel a lot of their spat. The spat is the larval side of oysters. This can help inoculate more places and spread oysters. So we've seen in the last hundred and so years that we've lost over 50% of our original oyster uh, reefs inside of the county. Many of those were harvested so that way they could be used for fill of roadways and different homesteads back in the day. Um, it takes an, a very long time for an oyster reef to be able to uh, replenish itself. So this is another project um, that we look forward to working on in the future. A couple of different um, videos here that we've done in the last couple of years really provide a good insight on different water quality issues. One that I'd like to point out on the right-hand side is the waterborne film. 
This is really a good opportunity if you're interested in water quality, policy, and public health. If you're interested, you can find this on our website or on YouTube. Here's a couple of different ways that you can support Waterkeeper or Calusa Waterkeeper. And I'll take some questions. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. I don't live on the water. Mm -hmm. I go to the beach periodically, but I do live on a golf course. Mm -hmm. Lots of ponds of water. You need, I don't sense it all of your, that's within your realm of interest. Um, it is, you know, especially if those golf courses have um, drainage links that go into different water bodies. So most of the golf courses, to the best of my knowledge, are underneath Lee County High Sun control. They provide a lot of different education on lakes and ponds inside of the county, and that's usually where the resources come for that type of um, environment that you're talking about. Yeah. But um, a lot of the different golf courses, too, have to fall inside of certain water quality parameters. And again, if, if the golf courses have some type of drainage link that links up to any of our water bodies, then it does fall underneath my purview. Before I get that's a question, uh, engage a start collaborating with the Calusa Water Keepers. We attempt to go to various sort of, uh, residential communities that have golf courses, et cetera, to get them to work with us to reduce the nutrients that, that start to build up in those, in those lakes. Uh, we were not successful. I mean, it, it's 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 tough to get these, these residential communities to make a change for a variety of good and bad reasons. So I, I just wanted to let, let you know that we've been trying to do that with the police and water keeper, but candidly haven't had much success. Hey Jim, up to your point, I want to steer on the on certain kinds of Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, it, it is a part. Is it clearly part of it? I don't pretend to be a scientist like John Pierce. But clearly, the issue is the issue is that nobody's paying attention to those lakes, including the CBDs. I mean, I mean, you know, I mean, they just aren't paying the kind of attention they should. But again, it's not that easy to do because they get resistance from residents that live in the community to come in and do anything. You know, they like their lake, they like their lake. And it's a it, it is a problem. The captain just talked about a series of things that are going wrong in Southwest Florida. Yeah. Yeah. Think about what you heard, and then think about what's happening. Ma'am, and then I'll go to you, sir. I'm sorry. So, what's just in the water? What is it that they're cleaning? Um, any types of nutrients that are in the water. Um, that's the primary thing, and they also uh, feed on different types of algae, so they can lower the amount of algae that's in the water as well. Any of the bad qualities within the water, they're not cleaning oils and metals and any of that. No, no. So, so hydrocarbons and and metals like that do do harm living organisms. So the primary thing that the um, oysters are are doing is that they're feeding on phytoplanktons. Um, that's something that can attribute to algae blooms as well as processing some nutrients. So they're feeding on organic materials that help lower the nitrogen count inside of a watershed. So it, it's basically picking up um, any of those nutrient sources that could manifest into something else or that they could contribute to um, a bloom of some sort. Yes, sir? I like to think ponds great to ponds to um, part, of, part of the issue, and I was a developer in the park, and uh, we went through a lot of times when we were doing development where we actually create stormwater management pond. Mm -hmm. Stormwater management ponds fail. They, they cannot last forever without being maintained. And I brought it up with two different CDDs down here and they say, oh no, ours aren't like that. I go, yes, they are. Because what happens is the nutrients and the siltation comes in at one end and typically leaves at the other end. Mm -hmm. And it goes somewhere. It may travel through other uh, lakes and then eventually runs into one of the streams. Uh, some of them run into the Estero River, potentially. And what happens is, as the siltation builds up, the effectiveness of the pond diminishes greatly through the years. Mm -hmm. And if they're not maintained by cleaning out the bottom and putting in new riprap and stuff like that, they're useless. Mm -hmm. um, and when we had our uh, 
two years ago at the Sparrow River Neighbors Update. Um, Block, sorry, but uh, one of the doctors from the water school pretty much said he goes, 98% of the ponds here do nothing. They look nice, people think they're doing things, and they're not doing anything because the differential between high water and low water, uh, everything at the bottom just stays there, and everything at the top just runs right through. Mm -hmm. So it's not really retaining anything. But that's one of the problems that I've seen down here in that. Various villages, towns, especially our county, has not put enough constraints on developers. Mm -hmm. and by constraints, I mean what we had to do when we went into a good town or, or city in New York, a good one that knew what they were doing. When we created these stormwater management ponds, <coughs> they they forced us um, or, or required us. I won't say forced because it was the right thing to do. But they required us to create a fund uh, on an ongoing basis to do that, that work mm -hmm. going forward. Well, down here in Florida, yes, you have to put the time in, and then the developer walks away. Nobody ever does anything in the future. There's no money to maintain it. So to your point, that's why the residents go, well, wait a minute, that's going to cost us money. Right. Somebody's right. going to raise our taxes. Right. Where it doesn't have to happen, because if it was, if it was going from day one, there would be a Typical reserve funding would be in place so that we would have to do these things that we had not done. Right. Absolutely. Right. No, and that and that's a great okay. point. That's one reason you know that we do partner with Engage Estero. Um, I know that before my time, there had been quite a few um, different projects that we were trying to collaborate on, and it is unfortunate that that cost tends to go to one person. Um, we would like to see that implemented, you know, and if we could find one developer that would take that into consideration. <laughs> You know, we could kind of have a poster child on the success of that. But a lot of these different um, ponds and wastewater treatment um, retention areas, as well as polishing ponds, um, whenever the nitrogen load and nutrient load is consistent at a high basis, you're always going to have an excess of that. So they do need to be maintained. And you're absolutely right. It's yeah. one of the systems that's part of ma um, routine maintenance in order to keep that the up. To the residents of Concord are concerned about the cost of you are offering I think it's, it's partly because the CDBs have not done a good job for the years. And a lot of the, the residents don't trust the CDB. And, and I'm not speaking of any particular one, but I could if you like it. As a follow up to that, have you done any of the research or work at all with uh, Benita with their? Um, uh, with the wood chip filtering that they're doing with the Imperial River? Um, I personally have not, no. Unfortunately, there hasn't been any noise about it since they put it in a couple of years ago, so I'm guessing that it isn't doing what they had hoped. But I know part of the reason was they weren't feeding it enough water to make it economically viable. Hmm. Um, it got a lot of good press. Yeah, the technology is it, it did. It did. And that's actually something that I was kind of hoping to catch on because if you can get big sugar to put those, um, those cleansing stations, if you will, at their drainage ditches, you can clean up a lot of the stuff that is ending up in the Okeechobee and the Poosahatchee and um, you know, trying to flow down through uh, the Everglades. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes, Alan. Uh, well, Captain, Captain Pierce, thank you again for a, a terrific presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, I have kind of two worries, uh, which I'd like you to maybe give us a comment on. Um, first is, we live in Florida. Uh, we have, of course, a great many visitors here uh, who can get the beauty of the coast and the, uh, and the sea and so forth. And of course, with all of these things happening, clearly, that has a detrimental effect, I'm sure, on uh, the amount of revenue that we can get from visitors coming here. So that clearly can have an impact uh, on where we live. Um, and I wonder if you could comment on that. But the other issue that I have also is on the blue green algae plant. Um, you know, I took a little look at this a little while back, and of course, it's interesting that in other parts of the world where the side of actor has been studied, perhaps maybe a little more than here. Um, the worries that you spoke about uh, of potential uh, 
neurological effects on people are very concerning. And I just wonder why um, that doesn't seem to have been given uh, as much publicity and as much warning as I personally feel it should be. So mm -hmm. that was my second question. Yeah. So the first question I can, I can briefly engage on, um, the year before Hurricane Ian, RSW experienced somewhere around 40 million visitors in one year. Um, we've definitely seen a huge decline in that since the storm, unfortunately. But what that really does is speak magnitudes to how important it is for us to consider this area as being an, an eco-based, eco-tourism-based economy. Really, all of our value is coming from our natural resources, and we need to do a much better job of, of protecting that and then also getting the word out for that, too. I think the more that we can talk about and have that conversation and really put a dollar amount to um, the importance of this thing, mo more people will open their eyes to it. Absolutely. Um, and then on the second side of that, you know, unfortunately, the, a lot of the cyanobacteria studies have not really been done here in Florida. There has been some that have been conducted, but not in the same magnitude of, of, as elsewhere in the world. Um, this is something that's kind of slow to come to fruition here because we were dealing with some of the consequences of, um, you know, major discharges that were coming in from inland. We've talked a lot about red tide. Um, this is something that we're just a, that was just a little bit behind as far as coming to the limelight, um, but it is something that is that is quickly gaining traction, um, and there is quite a bit of studying going on because again we have the University of Miami is doing something, FAU that's just north of us is conducting some studies as well as us, um, and a lot of institutions are really taking the cyanotoxin seriously now because it does pose a health risk. Again, the hard part is, is that there is no threshold that's in place now to know what is unsafe levels. And we're in the process now of identifying that there is cyanotoxin levels of some sort in different locations. So we're trying to identify hot spots during blooming seasons, and that'll kind of give us a baseline of better areas that we can accumulate the data. So that way we can, we can help contribute to coming up with a level for the threshold to know what is unsafe. Um, and that's just the slow process of getting that information out there. It's something that I wish that people would take more seriously as well. Um, but as you know, certain things are trending on the news. Usually the science stuff is not always at the top of the list. So. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Uh, every day, somewhere someone talks about climate change. Where do you view the, what's your view of where climate change is moving going to impact the work that we said? That your, that your organization has to accomplish. Okay, so that's a, that's a very good question. Um, we are experiencing certain levels of climate change here. One of, uh, of the most, you know, predominant ones is the increase in water levels, also the increase in storms that we've been experiencing. And then this year, the one that, that takes the cake for me is the increase in the UV intensity. You know, we hear this notion all the time that it keeps getting hotter. Everybody says that every year. It seems like it's getting hotter. Is it because I'm getting older? I'm not, I don't think so. <laughs> you know, this UV spectrum is increasing so much. So one of the things that we're seeing and is the increase in the amount of, of flora that's able to um, photosynthesize because there is more UV input, therefore there can be more growth. And since there's more nutrients, that happens on a huge scale. So how is global warming impacting the work that I'm doing is that I'm going to continue to have to think ahead each year on how much water quality testing I can do inside of a season how much of this aerosolized testing that I can do because there is a threat that the algae blooms could become a more consistent um, you know, problem for us and perhaps in a longer duration of time than what we're experiencing now. And then the other consequence of us dealing with higher levels of water, you know, sea level rise, is that that water is constantly in encroaching on the areas that we call home. The more that the water makes contact with our areas, the likelihood of pollutants goes up. It's just, a, you know, it, it's a a probability thing. So those are the two ways that I'm looking at the point sources for either nutrients or runoff or chemicals of some result of sea level rise happening on a more frequent basis. Um, and then also the wicking effect that happens too. So as sea level gets higher, the water has more force to push water inwards. And then when the water drops, it has a greater force of drawing nutrients out in a horizontal axis. So those are the two two things that I'm most concerned with and that I'm trying to stay on top of going forward with some of the issues we have. Captain, I've heard some very encouraging reports lately about a scale bay and how the has actually helped us. We've been seeing an increase in seagrasses. We're seeing a significant increase in water clarity. Are you 
sensing that or seeing that as well? Um, yes, in, in certain ways I am. I think one of the, the most unique things is that obviously Fort Myers Beach, you know, took a, a huge hit. We had an immense amount of storm inundation, especially in the Henry Creek sector. Um, overall, I think Estero Bay, in, in, in my observations of spending a lot of time on the water, especially in Pine Island Sound and Matt Lachey Pass, you know, the mangrove life there seems to be doing a little bit better than what I'm seeing to the north of that. I think as a result of all the storm surge and the force of that, it's removed a lot of the legacy nutrients inside of certain sections of the bay. There used to be an accumulation of legacy nutrients, which was sediment that was accumulated in that easterly portion. Um, I'm seeing a lot of areas that were down to bare substrate. So that is one thing that I think is, is, is definitely a positive. Um, one of the downsides, I think, you know, is the amount of storm surges that reach those upper extremities of the discharges. So Henry, Moloch, uh, Estero, Clear Creek, Imperial River, those are seemingly having um, point source issues because that nutrients was pushed up there and the water gets higher. Then we're starting to see, you know, in certain instances, our FIB numbers have gone up a little bit, at least for the time being. So it is promising. I think the majority of Estero Bay definitely got kind of like the broom experience for cleaning out a lot of the nutrients. But again, some of those areas, since it's had such an immense amount of water introduced to um, the surrounding uh, higher elevation areas, we've seen kind of that purging effect as, as the water has proceeded out, even being a year outside of Hurricane Ian. So it is good that we're experiencing a lot more fish inside of the bay. That's something that is um, always a good sign. It, it really is. You know, it, it's promising. Um, Estero Bay, I think, has the chance to be a really good poster child for a success story. I really, I really do. I think it's in very, you know, it has the opportunity to be re restored and to come to a higher level than what we're experiencing currently. I don't want to keep you. It's okay. Have one, one of, of course. Which is linked to what we were talking about at the public forum. We were talking, of course, about a lot more organization going on. I just wonder if, if there were like two or three things that we could discuss with uh, the village council in light of these developments. What things would you like to see the village council implement that might at least start to have some effect on all the issues we've been talking about with all of this development? Oh. There are, and that's an excellent question, Alan. So. Um, currently, in this fiscal year, we are inside of a fertilizer blackout right now. That's throughout the entire state of Florida. So there are no changes to any of our fertilizer ordinances that are currently in place. One way that I think that the council can step up is that we, you know, have a reassurance of the fertilizer ordinances that are already in place to make sure that they stay the same in the event that they could change them at a different time. Just the importance of that, trying to mitigate how much nitrogen can be introduced into a watershed. And I think that is one of the top lists because the entire water watershed of Estero Bay, its highest um, threat of impairment is coming from nitrogen sources. So if we talk about developments, usually um, some developments handle all that in-house with, you know, contractors, or if it's a development where the homeowner is responsible for their own lawn type of improvements, um, making sure that that fertilizer ordinance remains in place and perhaps increased in certain parameters, I think is that the first and foremost. Um, secondly, is really taking into account, you know, the impact that these developments have on the hydrological flow. So one of the most unique things about Estero Bay that starts all the way from the coastline, and pre proceeds easterly, all the way out off of Valico Road is that starting from inland Florida, you have this very gradual shelf that kind of makes a westerly, um, direction straight into a stero bay so whatever happens up there at some point is going to affect us down here taking into account how these developments can change the hyd hydrology um, and also their input sources on how that nutrients could be transmitted from uh, one place to another in a quick fashion especially when we have large weather events like this um, and then thirdly i think really just taking has to do with water as well but our water usage um, the freshwater side of things is one that doesn't get talked about that much, but whether it's coming from a municipality, if it's um, city water, um, water usages in that manner, but then also the amount of water that's drawn out of the aquifer. That can come from sprinklers, it can come from 
you know, just households that are using that. I think that's something that needs to be at the top of our list as well. The more groundwater there is and, and the amount of pressure that's inside of the aquifer helps keep, keep contaminants out and also lessens the likelihood of us having saltwater intrusion into the aquifer. Um, the unique thing about the Stero Bay is that certain, certain rivers in there used to have springs. That's something that we don't see anymore because we, we lack the water table and we also lack the amount of pressure that can expel the fresh water. But um, if we were able to protect that, you know, we won't go down the hill of it, of it getting much worse. So those are the three things I think that the council can definitely have an impact on this area. Because it is unique. There is no other place like Estero Bay and surrounding communities anywhere else in the state. If you've traveled the coast at all, um, I've been lucky enough to do it all the way from Alabama, all the way up the East Coast to Georgia. The Stero Bay is its own unique place. There is no other place like it. There will never be another one of these. So it's important that we take really good care of what we have left. If you get to travel inside of Chukalusky or the Everglades at all, you can see some reference, but they don't have the point sources like we do with having a couple of rivers and creeks. Um, and so it really is one of the most unique places. And I, I wish that people would really see the value more in trying to take care of it. Yeah. That's a uh, great segue into what Engage Estero is doing with the Calusa Water Keepers, with Sanibel Captiva uh, Foundation, um, and it's called the uh, Water and Environment Improvement Planning Steering Group. We pulled them all together. We've had several meetings with them. Uh, at the water school, and we're going to be meeting again with the, the captain on the 17th, a couple of days from now. Our objective is to do somewhat about what uh, Captain Pierce mentioned, and that is to try to come up with an approach to the village that lays out a number of hanging fruits and says, here are some things that you could do rather easily without significant cost, et cetera and let them pick what it is they want to do and start it that way. We know success begets success. We don't want to threaten them. We don't want to make them feel that all oh, this cli these climate change wackos are coming in, want us to do this kind of stuff. It's unfortunate, but that's how people think, and we know that. It's really, un really unfortunate. But with people uh, like Captain Pierce and others that we pull together as a, a collaborative group, uh, I think we can do something, and we're going to uh, pitch the council. We're going to pitch Sarkozy and the council and say, here's, here's what we've been thinking about. And it isn't just engage a sterile. It's a collaboration of scientists coming to the table. That's how we get things done. That's how we're going to make things happen going down the road. For those of you who know me for the last couple of years, I talk about collaboration. I talk about it increasing the volume of our voice. That's how you're going to make things happen. So. Thank you very much, Captain Pierce. Really, that was really, really good. Our other speaker, unfortunately, has gotten caught up in a flood, perhaps. Uh, and, yeah. I'm sorry, but he has a family emergency. Oh, there you go. I'm, I'm being cute. Thank you. Thanks. That, that's very helpful. Okay. So I think now, since uh, we've gone through the questions, Let's see if we can talk about some of the things that we're doing in Engage Estero. You know, you may remember that it wasn't too long ago, one of the first public forums we had was a public forum on water and the environment. And we did it in the water school. And it was really well attended. Bobby, you were there. I remember that. It was well attended and well done. Top notch speakers. You walked away from that saying, wow, these folks know what they're talking about. Why aren't more people listening to them? You know, that's, that's the key here. But uh, that was really important for us. And I think, I think we will continue to do this. Uh, it'll be on education and safety and transportation and water quality environment. Uh, hi. Hi. Uh, so let me begin by talking about uh, new board members uh, on the on Engage the Thorough Board. We, we have new board members. And they were just approved today. Um, the first, as you can see, is Brawley Adams. Brawley Adams looks like a teenager. Uh, and, and 
is going to bring a fresh look or a fresh look on what, what the board's going to be thinking about as we move down the road. Very nice young man, you know, happily married, We've got a nice little boy, and uh, he wants to stay in Estero and raise his family here. He works for a financial services organization. Karen Bodman is the administrative director of uh, Lee Health Coconut Point Lab. She's in the back room when you go get your, you know, get your lab done and all of that. She's in the back room making sure it's all being processed, which I didn't know. I didn't know they did it there. They actually did the processing there, right in the back of that room. I thought they sent it out. Anyway, Karen has been around for a while, 35 years in, in healthcare, um, and she now runs the lab there and, and also uh, uh, the, an outsource type lab they're trying to pull off. So I, we really agree. Uh, we had a board meeting today and, and they were unanimously brought in. So we're gonna start bringing in as many people as we can, younger than people that look like me, that's number one. And, and number two, get some more females in there, get some more females in there. We had, we had two of them when we first started in uh, this effort four years ago to move us to where we are today, uh, but that for various reasons, they had to do different things and they had to move on. So we're trying to do that. So look forward to hearing from these folks. They're pretty good. So let me tell you about what we're doing. Yeah. Uh, well, to begin with, it's all men. Joe Pavich is the ch uh, chair. You know Joe. Uh, those of you who know Joe's a senior, he's the chair. Uh, Lou Fratarelli is a member of the board. Uh, Reese, Reese Graber is a member of the board. Mike Wasson is a member of the board. Mike Wasson is really heavily involved and engaged there, very heavily with Alan in the communication side of thing, things. Uh, that's the board. It's, it's all, a lot of the people that were there left off. So I was happy that I had the opportunity. And, and actually, Brawley, uh, he's not up there. Brawley, let's see if I can get him back. Yeah, Brawley approached us um, because we just put out a brief Recruitment thing. Hey, you want to be on the board, et cetera? He raised his hand, and he's in there now. But that's the makeup of it. We'd like to get about 10 to 11 more uh, more people, but a total of 10 to 11 people up there, like hopefully 9 to, to 11. Uh, I think we can do it, and I'll talk to you about some of the reasons how we can do that in a minute. And that first thing is... Let me talk to you a little bit about fundraising, and I'm not going to be asking you for any money before you leave, so relax. Uh, okay, everybody goes, oh my God. Uh, <laughs> fundraising, uh, again, you, you've heard this from us if you've been around and you've, you've heard what we have to say. It is absolutely essential that Engages Stero uh, develops enough money uh, putting in its uh, impact fund to reach sustainability. Uh, we have costs. Everything we do costs us. And the only way we get money, since we don't have a product per se, is people have to donate. They have to donate. We like to call it investing. Investing through us in Greater Estero to help us do the kinds of things we'd like to do. So fundraising is moving ahead. Um, we, think, we think we're going to be successful at it. You can expect somewhere in the spring of 24 to start to see a major push out there for funding for uh, Engage Estero. We will be telling you what we're gonna do with that money very clearly. You'll understand what it's about, where it's gonna go and so on, but it'll help. Uh, candidly, there's no other organization like Engage Estero anywhere in Southwest Florida, nowhere. It's, we are, the, we are the, the sons and daughters of the ECCL who started the village of Estero. We would not have the village of Estero if it wasn't for the EC sale and people like Don Essen. And we've got a program we're thinking about doing that I cannot talk about now, but you will hear about it. That has to do with Don Eslick and honoring that man uh, for what he and his people did, including Bob, who was at his side for many, many years. So the fundraising thing is really important to us. I've just given you some ideas of what we do with the money. Uh, Last year, uh, when they had the light up Estero that was sponsored by the Estero Rotary, we donated about $3,000 to help them. This year, we couldn't. This year, we couldn't. So we gave them $1,000. We all, you know, we, we have a pot, and it goes like this towards the end of the year, right? So uh, we, had to give, we gave them $1,000. They were very happy for it, but we were unhappy that we couldn't give them more. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's unfortunate, but that, that's what takes place. 
The donation of 5,000 we gave to the Estero High School Sports Program, which is, we did it last year, and we got so many, so many, uh, I guess, laudits uh, for what we did. People came up to us and talked to us. Boy, that was really great. You sponsored that game, you know, between Bonita Springs and, and so on. And, of course, Estero's kicking their butts. I mean, it's, it was terrible, this last game. I mean, just destroy them. In any case, in any case, that's that's an example of the, some of the things we, we do. Uh, some of you were at the public forum on uh, the future for sterile uh, development issues. I recognize Bob, and there were several others. I recognize Julie. Uh, that public forum came about from people who get who donated their time. Those folks were not. The panel that we had there were not paid anything. They wanted to come in, they wanted to talk. And one of the major, one of the speakers there that I, I think is a star, was the star of it was Steve Sarkozy. No doubt about it. Uh, who is the village manager, for those of you who don't know who Sarkozy is. But he had a lot, he, he had the answers for people. He didn't always like the answers, but he had the answers for them. And the other ones were more or less supporting a lot of what he did but they brought their own perspective on development issues, and impact fees, and how the environment, the kinds of things that the captain's talking about. It was a, it was a major, I think, absolutely major success. We had about 340 people sign up, register to come to it. About 225 showed up. That's okay, that's good, because of the 700 watch the recording. So the point is, it, it, people are interested, if you give them quality, People will start to understand, hey, these guys know what they're talking about, guys and girls know what they're talking about, so we should support them as best we possibly can, and that's what we're looking to do. Uh, one of the other things we're looking for, looking at is this issue of workforce, workforce housing. Now, that is not affordable housing. It is not Section 8 housing. It is to try to get housing that are, is reasonable in cost for people who work in a sterile and serve us all that just can't afford to pay the, the exorbitant cost of living here for, for people, the servants that come down and do that. It, it's been kicked around as long as, I, as I've been around in, in, in uh, when it was ECCL and primarily in the last couple of years it's even more. Workforce housing issue is a, is a national a national catastrophe. People cannot find places to live in the area they work. We have to do something about it. Again, it's got to be a collaborative effort. And we're going to be talking to a variety of people who already started talking to people like uh, Sheldon Weeks, Professor Sheldon Weeks at FTCU. We're, 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 we're talking to others that have an interest in making this happen because their organizations survive on it. They got to pay teachers. We have to pay police, firemen, all these, all these folks, and nurses. I mean, it's right. Lee Help is dying because of these things. They don't. They don't have anybody to serve. It, it, it's really, it's really bad news. But I wanted you to know that we are serious about moving ahead. We may run into stones. We may run into walls. We may run into obstacles. But we're going to keep it up until we're actually exhausted. We're not going to. We're not going to make it. But again, I think if we get the right people around us and we pull together a coalition or collaborate with these folks, we can make impacts. We have to do it because if we don't do it, we won't suffer in this room. It'll be the people that are living here after us, our kids, our grandchildren, relatives that want to come down. They'll take over your place because they're on. That kind of thing is absolutely essential. I also want to talk about, let's see if this goes to the next one. No, we're going too fast. It's not up there. Engage is sterile. It's a communications company. It has a media platform. We have about close to 10,000 people that we connect with every day. Uh, all the emails you get, you get tired of getting them sometimes. We get them out there. We push them out there. But candidly, there's no other organization that's telling you what's happening in the sterile. Think about it. Think about what you get, what, who's giving you the news. You pick it up on TV, that's for sure. They'll tell you about the worst that's happening in the sterile every time you turn it on. 
But we have decided that we're going to do a quality job in making the communications you get quality communications, accurate communications, no miscommunication, no misinformation, none of that. It's, gone, it's been a terrific, terrific advancement over the last several years. A lot of it has to do with Alan Bodich here, who works with me. He's my right-hand communications guy. And we are so, I'm so pleased with it. People are constantly telling us, you guys are really doing a great job with that communications. The only way it's going to continue, we've got to have the money. We have to have this. It's important. And yeah, it's not for him. No, no. Yeah. They're going to, and if I'm successful, they're going to double my salary. No, no. There is no. There is no. Yeah, a lot of Fistero is something that the Rotary puts on every year about Christmas time. And they, they bring uh, rides together in a certain location. I think last year it was in a church book, 41. And they just treat these kids and they give them money and they give them gifts and they give all kinds of things. It's a nice thing that the Rotary does. So we just help them out. And we show up and applaud them at the, in their efforts. Um, so that's really my, my pitch. And, and it gives you an idea what, what we are doing. Please visit the star, uh, Estheraltoday.com. That's our website. And you can see all the things that we have our fingers in, what we're trying to do. You see great articles that are, are posted on the website. We post them in the emails. Uh, it's just um, the organization has come a long way. We're, we're glad to be Don Eslick's grandkids. It's that simple. We're, we're glad to do it. And it's working well for, for the city the municipality, but we're not going to be able to do it without support. It's that simple as that. It's, uh, if we don't get support, it's going to be a problem. Right. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, the next meeting that we're going to have is December 7th. It's going to be in the Hestero High School, Hestero High School. Uh, and it's going to be on the future plans for schools and students' education in greater Hestero. Now, again, we're doing it in the evening like this because we, we want to offer it to the younger people who are working during the day and give them a shot to come in and see what's going on. So uh, the, Dr. Malloy and Chris Patrika, many of you may know their names, very bright people, will come in and talk about this and give people the opportunity to ask them really what's happening in terms of education in greater Estero. Education's an important, an important piece. Uh, we know that. We tie into FGCU because of who they are, what they try to do. That helps us because we are here to inform you. FGCU helps us do that as well. This is basically, what about the kids? What about the little ones that are coming up? Who's taking care of their needs? Not only in the classroom, but outside and in the home. These are the kinds of things that people are, are should be done, should be done to continue the kind of uh, quality of life we have living here. So that's that one. Is there another one? Yes. Yes. This, this one is coming on the 25th of January. It'll be here, the Parks and Recreation. It's very interesting. I don't know if you know Jody Walborn. Uh, the, she's with Blue Zones. Are you familiar with Blue Zones? You know, a great, great program. She's going to come in and talk about uh, what you can do to extend your life, life expectancy. I think you'll find it very interesting. She's very good at her feet. The other one is, that's Tony Carangelo. Tony Carangelo is the chief researcher of officer of Engage Estero, who is a genius in math and in uh, data and technology. Very, very smart man, giving a lot of time to us to create some programs for people, again, to get a better understanding of what Estero really is in, in terms of issues and things that are happening, but he's going to put it in maps, and he's going to have stories behind the maps. So when you go on the computer, you'll be able to see so much more than you get now, other than lines going like this. Fascinating stuff, fascinating stuff, and much more than that. Very, very bright man. I'm very happy to have him on our team. And I think that it, my friend over there, ah, yeah, final questions. 
What do you What do you think? Anything in your mind that you might want to talk about in terms of anything? Yeah, Bob. Something that has been really, really troubling me more recently, and I know you're from Spring Run, you probably know what I'm leading up to, but traffic enforcement, Minister, I'll be clear to comment about the rest of the state of Florida, but it's pathetic. We all know that uh, we're seeing evidence of it every day, more and more accidents, fatalities. Terrible. So, how can we as a community, how can we engage a steroid? Energize uh, the county, the district, uh, the sheriff, whatever, to take some really concrete actions other than just talking about it. You know, sometimes I don't know. Um, clearly, uh, clearly, the, what's raised this issue of traffic, it's always been around, you're absolutely correct, but this horrific accident took place on Williams and 41, absolutely devastating. Uh, people that engage in sterile, people we know knew, knew the four women. I mean, it, it's, just, it's just terrible. And there's all kinds of talk that takes place after that. Oh, it was the motorcycle's fault. Oh, the woman just didn't watch the light. And you make prejudgments, and we don't really know the act. We'll wait to have to see what Carmine comes out with, with, with his investigation and so on. But there is a, it's really tough. For, for example, we've been, we beat this up at our last meeting. Uh, we did. We beat this up at our last meeting. About what would be the role of engaged Estero in something like this. I think we have to... We have to sit and think about it candidly. We have to talk to people about it, get more insights into the real issues and uh, that, and what the potential solutions really are. For example, uh, one that pops up is, you know, you've got you've got these cameras throughout the roads. Well, why don't you change them into cameras when they see somebody, and as the camera picks up somebody doing over the speed limit, give them five or ten, uh, six miles, etc. You automatically get a summons in the mail. Seriously, they run a light, same thing. Get a, they're doing it all over the country. This is nothing new. I mean, but we're not doing it here. But those, those kinds of things are what people are talking about now. More education, more education in schools, et cetera. But come down hard. Somebody once said, if somebody gets so many tickets, so, such and such, you confiscate their car with their motorcycle. Confiscate it, just take it, put it away, and it's not theirs anymore. I mean, that's, that may be how you get to this, I mean, to get to people's attention. So when I said I really don't know, Bob, I don't know. Uh, I think it's going to take uh, a number of, 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 of um, official agencies, and there are several of them, to start to come to terms with this and do something about it. It's, it's, it's just like people go... You know, it would be like if, if we all put on red shirts and went up to the commissioners meeting up there, we got 300 people sitting in red shirts about it. I've seen that happen several times. Sometimes it works. Too often it doesn't work. That's it. Too often it doesn't work. You've been at them. I've been at them. So I don't know the answer to that. You folks should hear. Try to do some research on your own. Or if you hear if a group is being formed, for example, on this particular issue, uh, the sheriff has said he wants to form a panel. That's what we've heard. We heard that just the other day, right? He wants to, perform, he wants to sort of set up a panel to learn more about you know, what the people think. Come on, come on. What the people think, they're, all, they're horrified. People are really upset about things. So we don't know really what the outcome's gonna be but we're going to play a role in it. We're just not sure exactly what that's going to be. It is. No, it, it is. But we want to be smart about it. We want to be smart, and we want, we want, to, be, we, we want to be right. Uh, and we're not going to do it by just shooting it, right? So that's what we're doing. Any, anything, anything else that you guys have in mind about anything at all you think we should listen to? Okay. Uh, on that note, I'm going to say that it's over. <laughs>